I don't know about you, but I haven't been able to run down a horse lately by any means. And I always found that, and I guess they were doing the best with what they had. Of course, he was killed before the end of the Civil War, actually down in Greenville, Tennessee. He was initially buried in Richmond, Virginia, and then after the Civil War, his body was brought back, and he's actually buried today at the Lexington Cemetery in the Morgan family plot. Uh, another thing that was a very ugly part of the Civil War experience in Kentucky was guerrilla warfare. The three names of individuals, there were many, but Sue Mundy, Chet Ferguson, and William Contrell all had roles here. Sue Mundy's actually a, a man, but uh, there's some interesting discussion about why he got that name. Part of it maybe that he had a kind of a female-looking face. Um, Chet Ferguson actually had grown up on the Kentucky-Tennessee border, was actually uh, tried and court-martialed, killing about 40-some men. It's believed that he actually was guilty of killing many more, but they figured sentencing him to death for 40 was sufficient to do the job. And he made a last request that his body be buried on good rebel soil. That was one of the last things that he asked for before he was hung. William Quantrell, uh, is, you may be familiar with, in the Kansas, Missouri bloody period prior to the Civil War, I think things must have gotten too hot for him. In 1864, he came into Kentucky, actually came to uh, Danville, where it's documented, and came in and tore up a lot of uh, the local things and got a lot of forces. And he actually was mortally wounded and uh, ended up dying in a military prison in Louisville. Most of the time, these guerrillas were not connected to either the Union or the Confederate Army. Some of them may have had some connection at some point, but they basically were not operating under the orders of either government. And in, in many cases, you find that actually they were basically outlaws, and the war was a good pretext to go around and do the kind of things that they wanted to do. I think one of the very tragic parts of the that guerrilla war effort was the fact that many of the farms and homes where the men had left to go to the war were basically being maintained by the mothers, the women, and the children. And so oftentimes when they would hear the hoofbeats coming down the road, they didn't know whether it was a cavalry unit or whether it was a guerrilla unit. So it had to be a very disquieting time and experience. And the guerrilla actions were very destructive. A lot of what happened is actually documented in the court records following the Civil War and certainly would be a very fertile field for um, further historical study. But what was the cost of the war to Kentucky? In the men who served in the Civil War, there were 30,000 casualties suffered. There were about 100,000 men that served in the Union Army, about 40,000 in the Confederate Army. And so 28% of those that served in the Army died. And unfortunately, the, the cause of most of those deaths was two to one uh, disease over actual battle wounds. And the other big cause was accidents. You read a, a lot of inadvertent firing of weapons that resulted in someone's death. So 28% of the men that went off actually became casualties. There was a lot of damage to the homes and farms for a variety of reasons, whether it was something around the battles that were fought or whether it was due to real action or whatever. A lot of the mules and horses I mentioned were taken and also a lot of the agricultural foodstuffs were taken to provide supplies for the army on both sides. With the end of slavery, slavery ended it, even though the state had not ratified the 13th Amendment, uh, that certainly was a large loss to those in the material value of the, those slaves that they had, had working for them and the uh, things that they were able to accomplish through that uh, bondage slavery or the bondage work that they were getting from. And one of the really long-term costs of the war, as I mentioned, was the attitude of Kentuckians toward the federal government. There was some actual interference in elections, both state and federal, by the federal government. Uh, some of the abuse and just mistreatment of the people by some of the military leaders in the government. And this all ended in a very strong reaction in the post-Civil War. As I mentioned, Kentucky had not seceded during the war, but many would say that in fact, in, in after war years, it actually did. Um, here's some truths about the state. We started out with the myths about Kentucky and the Civil War. Here's the truth. It's true that Kentucky was only neutral from May until September of 1861. It's true, as I just mentioned, that it did provide a large number of men to the armies of both North and South. It's very true that it was very eagerly sought by both sides, both the Confederacy and the federal government wanted Kentucky on their side. Kentucky contributed over 79 general officers to both sides during the Civil War, and I will readily admit that, like General Morgan, he was not born in Kentucky, but we adopted him as Kentucky. Uh, general John Hood and Albert Sidney Johnson both had gone to Texas, but they were both native born Kentucky. So the state claims about 79 general officers, which is pretty significant for a state's contribution. And then, as I point out, a lot of horses, mules, and 
foodstuffs were provided. In the post-war years, very quickly, in fact, if you read the third volume of the State History of Kentucky called Decades of Discord, you'll find that very shortly after the Civil War, former pro-Confederates or previously Confederate veterans returned to the state were quickly elected into the legislature. And in fact, being a, a veteran of the Confederate Army was a political asset, and being a veteran of the Union Army, even though they'd won the war, was a political detriment. Uh, throughout the, well, certainly throughout the latter part of the 1800s. And it's interesting that three of our state governors fought in the war, um, General Simon Oliver Buckner and uh, James B. McCreary, both actually served in the Confederate Army. And uh, Dr. Luke Blackburn was elected governor. He had act, he's actually was a physician, and actually it's known that he attempted to spread yellow fever in certain northern cities during the Civil War by sending infected clothing to those cities but he was elected uh, governor after the war some decades later and actually had a major factor in the prison reform of the penitentiary of Kentucky. So just some very interesting things that occurred here in the state of Kentucky after the war was over. Well, you have an extensive bibliography in your handout, and if you ever have any questions about books on the Civil War, please feel free to contact me in Frankfurt. I did want to highlight these are the actual books that have been written about the Civil War in Kentucky in a broad context. The first one was written in 1926 by Dr. Merton Coulter. Um, the second one, which is actually this little book, was first printed in 1976 by Dr. Lowell Harrison. It's called The Civil War in Kentucky. Uh, the New History of Kentucky, which has been out a few years now, has a very outstanding chapter, a bibliographic essay, on the topic of the war in Kentucky in it. And there's a book that I mentioned that uh, one of my fellow co-workers at the uh, Kentucky Historical Society it wrote, it actually came out in March, and you can get a copy of it at Amazon.com if you're interested. It's definitely a very enlightening uh, history of what happened after that particular Civil War battle. And then I actually have a contract on a book that will come out about a year from now, and it, it's a much larger uh, book than this one. This one's actually 106 pages long. Mine will be about 300 pages long, which will go into much greater detail of what we've talked about tonight. And it's got the same title, Torn Between the North and South, the Civil War in Kentucky. So if you're interested in the Civil War in Kentucky, I have a contract now. It's no longer, well, I might get this published. It is going to be published. And, it, and you can keep in touch with me concerning that. But it should probably be out about, I would guess, about a year from now, hopefully prior to the parable reenactment in uh, October of 2013. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those while we have time. If anybody has any questions, uh, please, I've, I've, this is the opportunity for you to ask those. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Please. Um, pardon my ignorance, but I don't know where Logan County or Russellville is. Okay. Logan County is just west of Bowling Green, and Russellville is a, a small community there in Logan County, but it's actually the next county over from Bowling Green, down there in the... In the more western part of it. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Were both armies confiscating uh, horses and that sort of thing? Yes, and that actually it's very interesting that the Union Army provided horses to their men for their cavalry. The Confederate Army's cavalry was required to procure their own horses. So if, you, if your horse got shot or became maimed, uh, the Union Army would actually provide a new one if you were a Confederate cavalryman, you had to start looking. And uh, there were lots of instances. One of the instances of uh, William Quantrell, a gorilla, they actually went into a, far, a barn there in, uh, I think it was in Boyle County or in the neighboring area, and uh, a Union State Guardsman tried to stop them. And the gorilla said, well, we're going to take these horses. And he said, oh, my dead body. And the gorilla said, well, that can be uh, taken care of. And he killed the guy right there and took the horses. So you have to be careful what you say when you're dealing with an armed man. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had an uncle, old uncle, tell me one time when I was a kid that they hid the horse in a haystack to keep it from being stolen. Yeah, he mentioned that, he had, that uh, someone in his family had uh, hit a horse to prevent them from being stolen. That happened quite a lot. And I want to tell you, very quick story. Um, in the last, I think it's about 1864, March of 1864, um, Nathan Bedford Forrest sent a group up to Paducah, and they knew he was coming, so they took a large number of the good horses and hid them 
So when Forrest came to Paducah, they didn't get the horses they had come after. He eventually left because there was an outbreak of smallpox. But then they stupidly wrote that they had uh, fooled General Forrest by hiding the horses. So when he got a copy of the newspaper, he sent a detachment back to go get them. And this time they got the horses. That actually happened. But yes, I think that's quite uh, true. Also, a lot of the valuables were hidden. Uh, I have a former co-worker whose uh, grandmother or great-grandmother, one lived down in the Bowling Green area, and she took the family uh, valuables and put them down a well in order to prevent the Union Army from finding them. And lots of other instances like that. But yes, there was a, if they would know that someone was coming, that was usually caused to try to hide the things. And of course, one of the very tragic things with a lot of people being uh, subsistence farmers was that their seed corn and things that they needed to plant for the next year armies would come through and take those and oftentimes this I, i've read of instances where it was only the wife and the family the husband and sons adult sons were gone off to the war and they would come in and take all of their seed for the next season and which puts them in a really bad situation for you know being able to feed themselves in the coming year any other questions Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm assuming that when you say uh, Kentucky had uh, the third largest number of slave owners, right? That that's actual numbers. That's not percentage. No, that's actual. Uh, it, the actual number of slave owners and the actual number in comparison to all the states and the number of people that own slaves. Okay, yeah. I, I had read somewhere in another article on the economics of slavery in Kentucky that. There were actually not that many slaves because there were so many um, unskilled workers that it was actually cheaper to hire an unskilled worker than it was to keep a slave. Yeah, as far as the number of slaves, that's not true. But, but the number that I'm giving you is the actual number of people yeah. that own yeah. slaves. That, that implies that these people had maybe a couple of slaves, right. but not right. very many. Right. And a lot of the slaves were being used either in like domestic work in the cities like Lexington, Louisville, uh, or they were being hired out to do different kinds of work, uh, some of them very skilled and some not, or they were back actually being used to work on the farm. But you're right, the total number of slaves wouldn't even come close to some of the really large slave owners, but the number of actual people uh, it was the third one. Is that, is, that, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. I, I would think Kentucky was not particularly well populated compared to the eastern states in by 1861. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with those numbers, but I mean, you can certainly find that. That would be yeah. possible. I mean, some of them have the slaves, some of them in Canada. It's not very really great, but my family had to do it. Right. right. Not many. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. When you refer to the uh, provisional government, is that the same as what they call the shadow government? I don't know, uh, and actually, I, I don't really know. To be honest, if you ask me to explain the definition, but uh, I think it's basic. You know, this is basically they thought that they were actually the rightful government of Kentucky, and they were just waiting for Robert McGoffin to just leave town so they could come to Franklin. Yeah, hey, I've, I've read of a shadow government that actually uh, had representatives in the Confederate States of America. Yes, they did. They sent representatives to. Um, England places trying to get funding. For well, certainly the provisional government did have representatives in the Confederate uh, Congress. Yeah, it's true. probably the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, there's a statue of John Hood Morgan in Lexington on a horse. Yes. Uh, is the uh, horse sculpted correctly? Well, I understand there's controversy about that. I won't get into it, but you know. Yeah, I understand there's some controversy about that. I, I didn't know if there's anything. Yeah. 